Would you turn with me in your Bibles today to the book of James? Uh, we have been looking at over the last couple of months, and we're down to the last of chapter 4, with one more chapter left in this short book. And I want to start today uh, with this phrase, best laid plans. You may have used that phrase, and like many for me, it's one that I assumed had some kind of origin somewhere, that most of the time, things that get said like that... Uh, they come from some place in literature or in history or whatever. I was curious even if this one might not even be a phrase that comes from Scripture. Uh, if you read through your whole Bible, I think you'd be amazed how many turns of phrases that we use all the time that have their roots in Scripture. But this one does not, at least not these words. The idea very much comes from Scripture, and even I would submit to you today from the book of James where we're going to read today. But actually, best laid plans, or more specifically best laid schemes, comes from a poem. Uh, in fact, it comes from a poem called To a Mouse by Robert Burns. And if you don't recognize that, if you're like me, I don't read a lot of poetry regularly. Um, tried to stay awake as best I could in the times when I had to study it in school. But Robert Burns wrote this poem in 1785. And this poem, actually the longer name of it is, and this kind of tells the whole story, is To a Mouse on Turning Up Her Nest with a Plow. Um, and so I guess like most poets, whatever happens in your life, you just write a poem about it. Um, and Robert Burns, uh, legend has it, was plowing his field when he turned up the nest of a mouse um, in that field and the mouse went frightened uh, running away. And so having destroyed this mouse's nest, uh, which it would have needed to survive the winter, it began to kind of make the wheels in his own mind start uh, to turn. Um, in fact, I uh, saw a picture. I don't know that this is an actual picture of the actual event, but uh, from 1785, it might have been this. And even in this picture, if you look very closely right below his plow there, you can see that frightened mouse running away. But this is what he says. These are, um, and if you were to go back and look this up, it's actually written um, in kind of an older Scottish uh, dialect called Scots and you wouldn't be able to recognize a lot of the words so this is the more modern English uh, version of this but this is near the end of this poem two of the stanzas say this but mousy you are not alone in proving foresight may be in vain the best laid schemes of mice and men go often astray and leave us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. It's kind of a morbid poem. He says, look, the best laid plans often go astray, and he says that most of it, whether uh, it be a mouse or a man, it leads to nothing but grief and pain when we were hoping for joy in our lives. But one of the last stanzas says this, still you are blessed compared with me. He's still talking to the mouse. You are blessed compared with me. The present only touches you. But oh, I backward cast my eye on prospects dreary, and forward, though I cannot see, I guess and fear. You get what he's saying there? He's saying, I wish I was a mouse. At least a mouse is frightened right now, but he'll be over it. He doesn't look back on past events and doesn't look forward to the future, but I do, and I see nothing but guess and fear. But... He's kind of saying that's life. Whether you're a mouse or a man, your plans, however well laid, often get messed up. And after all, the mouse has it easy compared to humans. Mice live in the present moment by while humans look to the past and regret and to the future with fear. And he might say, lucky mouse. Is that all we're left to as human beings? That's a, uh, from 1785, that's a very humanistic modern way of thinking is to say, well, there's nothing you can do about anything, so do the best you can. Um, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches us. In fact, I think the Bible teaches us a bigger view of life even than that, and more precisely, a bigger view of God than that. So let's read just a few verses from James chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 13. We're only going to read to 17 today, so a short passage. Hear the word of the Lord. This is from James chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. 
why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. May God bless his word for us today. Let's talk about that last verse. In fact, let me back up to it just one second. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin for them. This is what we call a sin of omission. Now we commit a sin of commission a lot of things. That's a, when the Bible says, thou shalt not, and we do it, then we have committed. We've committed a sin uh, of commission. But a sin of omission are all the things we ought to do and yet don't do. The things that God has commanded for us to do. And I would submit to you that even today that includes what we ought to know and what we ought to believe. If the Bible has made it plain and let we, yet we live in a way in which it's not true, then we have committed a sin against God. And I think that's what this short passage is getting at, is there's something you should know about God and His will and our perspective as human beings. And if you don't live in that way, James would say, then your faith isn't showing as it should. In fact, he would say, let's ask some questions. So for James, as we come to verses 13 through 17, um, all this is to say is this, doing the will of God is another test of our living faith. I've been uh, asking us to consider as we go through James, all the things that he says, if you have faith, your life should look something like this. And if my life doesn't look something like that, then I should ask myself about my faith. And so these questions come to us. Is it your strong desire to do God's will? Do you find yourself with ease praying the disciples' prayer? We prayed it today. Um, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that an easy prayer for us to pray? Do we think through it when we pray it here or do we pray it carelessly and recklessly, not really considering what we are saying there? Does that come easy to us because that's the cry of a heart of a true child of God seeking to do God's will. Constant disregard, and I want you to hear this, constant disregard for and constant disinterest in the will of God is the surest evidence of pride. James has been speaking against pride in this whole chapter. He says lots of uh, sinful attitudes and actions come from pride, and this is one more of them. To not acknowledge God's rule over us and not to seek to do what God wants us to do then is tantamount to arrogance and pride. And you can tell his language is very strong here once again against that kind of pride. And so we have to ask, am I the ruler of my life? Am I the king of my own life? Am I, uh, will I be sovereign in my own life? And is that the kind of pride that resides in me? Because that can be a barrier to the kind of faith that God wants us to have. Remember James has said in this very chapter that God gives grace to the humble. And a stance, an attitude, or a heart of pride works against receiving what God wants us to have. So let me sum this whole thing up in three simple things. Um, and it goes like this. How do we plan our lives, both in the short term and the long term? How do we go about our lives in a way that pleases God, that acknowledges God, that, acknowledges God, that really uh, lets God be on the throne? Well, our plans are always subject to these things. The first, James says, is the uncertainty of the future. In fact, verse 14 says, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? And all of us have places in our life in which we're reminded we don't know about any, with any certainty what will happen tomorrow. As God seems to do to me lately, whatever I'm working on a sermon, he seeks to demonstrate it in my own life, which is always really good for me. 
But this week, God interrupted a whole lot of plans that we had and changed them um, to do. I'm not sure what, but I hope at least to humble us and to maybe point us to our need for Him. In fact, before the service, Suzette said, please be sure and thank everybody for the prayers that they prayed for us this week. If you don't know uh, what I'm talking about, this week we had a big event in our family's life. My daughter, Abby, was on the homecoming court. We had all kind of plans. My parents were coming to town. In fact, Suzette's mom is here with her today. That part did work out. Um, But Wednesday evening, Abby ended up in the hospital with food poisoning. Uh, And there was a time where the doctor, even though he's a doctor that sits right here next to my family almost every Sunday, wasn't sure she was going to be able to continue through the weekend. And I was sitting in her hospital room working on this sermon, and it occurred to me, well, here's one of those best laid plans. Not only uh, was she sick, my parents who were supposed to come here are not here because we've been praying for them the last couple weeks in Bible study. My mom has a severe back issue uh, that she finally was able to get into a doctor's office. She woke up last weekend with shingles on top of that. There are all kind of ways in which God um, sometimes gently but sometimes not so gently reminds us there's a lot that's really out of our control. And so when we say the uncertainty of the future, we mean all that and much more. In the grand scheme of things, um, are some things relatively minor? Will we look back on a week in, in the life of our family and say, boy, that was a horrible week? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm also uh, aware of, boy, it sure made us pray a whole lot more this week. It made a lot of you pray more uh, this week for something. And what an encouragement to see God answered a lot of those prayers. And so I'm thankful that God did that this week when I was looking at this passage and he said, let me just remind you of a few things. But on a much bigger scale, what if I even said three uh, names to you today? If I said the names Harvey, Irma, and Maria, does that ring a bell with a lot of people? If you live in Texas, Florida, or Puerto Rico, or the Bahamas, those words mean a lot to you now. Talk about best laid plans. Think of all the things that the whole island of Puerto Rico is still without power. Think of all the plans that have gone by the wayside and all the things now that a whole uh, 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 island full of people could care less about today. Big plans, all kinds of parties and weddings and events and concerts and plays and all the things that fill our lives and all of a sudden that we can have the perspective of this isn't such a big deal at all, and I'm not sure about tomorrow. Something, sometimes that's a good thing, and James says we should live like that all the time, not just when crisis hits, but we should understand that our plans are always subject to change because of the uncertainty of the future. But he doesn't leave us there because that would be kind of a grim thing to go. Who knows? Don't make any permanent plans. They might fall apart, and then you're, uh, you know, you're just out of luck. Um, That's not what James says, so hang with me just a second. The second one is this. Our plans are subject to not only the uncertainty of the future, but the frailty of life. In fact, he asks at the second, in verse 14, he says, What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I don't think James is meant to be fatalistic to say, You live, you die, that's all there is to life. I think he wants us to gain a proper perspective on life. In fact, it was said long ago that um, uh, uh, when an eastern emperor uh, was crowned at Constantinople, if you know that part of the world, that a royal mason would be dispatched immediately to the new ruler and he would lay out marble slabs before him and in that moment as he was ready to ascend to the throne of that kingdom, he would have to pick out his own tombstone. And they wanted a reminder is, yes, you have great power, majesty, glory, all the things that belong to a king of a mighty kingdom, but we want you to remember that your life is but a mist. And there will come a day when they lay you in the ground and something will be written on your tombstone. You pick it out. You decide what it wants to look, to look like and you live your life in a way that would do that. I don't think that when it says your life appears as a mist that this is really making a statement about the quickly passing time. We all know that. They start telling you that when you're young, right? Some of y'all who are still junior high and high school age or whatever, um, some reason we adults like to tell kids, well, enjoy it while you can. Boy, it's gone like that. As soon as you get married, people say, boy, it goes quick. As soon as you have children, boy, you better enjoy it now because it's gone before you know it. Um, 
Don't we know that time passes? Sometimes I think, I don't need to be reminded of that. And you can't slow it down by you reminding me of it. So you can save your breath on that. But we know life goes quickly. The Bible points that out in many, many places. Psalm 90 is one of them. Uh, Psalm 90 says that the years pass quickly. And you may have 70, 80 or more of them if you're fortunate here on this earth. But they quickly pass and then you fly away. You know... Never thought of it, that song that we sing, I'll Fly Away, um, might be a reminder is, yes, we will all fly away eventually. It passes. So the frailty of our lives and the brevity of our lives is there. And I think James wants us to have some perspective in that to say, don't forget that there's uncertainty in your life. There's brevity in your life that we cannot change. And we have to go about our life like we acknowledge that God has given us the gift of life, but none of it is guaranteed. And we live it for him and by him and through him. Why do we do that? And that's really the last point is this. It's because of what we acknowledge as the sovereignty of God. I know that's not uh, other than talking about sovereign nations. We don't use that word sovereign very often. And maybe for good reason. Nobody is sovereign in and of themselves. And actually, when we talk about a sovereign nation, no nation is ultimately sovereign. You're only sovereign if nobody is more powerful than you are. Um, and that changes over, uh, sometimes within a few years, but within centuries, that changes often. But what do we mean about this? Well, listen to what James says again in verse 15. He says, instead of being arrogant and boastful because of the uncertainty and frailty of your life, we need to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. He says, we should say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting as is evil. James says, acknowledge that God is God. In fact, I love, I heard a long time ago, in fact, I saw this on a t-shirt. I think I've said this to some of you before. Uh, all of life could be summed up in this. There is a God and you're not him. If we know that, you've got a long way down the road in understanding God's sovereignty. There is a God who not only created the heavens and the earth, but he rules and reigns over them. I love this illustration that I read. If you were to take ten pennies in your hand, and you wrote one, two, three, on, uh, uh, up to ten on those ten pennies. You shook them up and you put them in your pocket. Um, and the goal was to draw them out in sequential order. Uh, having drawn one, put it back in and you're drawing one out of ten every time. This is how those odds would go in that. Putting each coin back in your pocket after each draw. You draw out one, you put it back and draw out two, put it back and draw out three. Your chance of drawing the number one is one in ten. There's ten pennies in there, you draw it out. Your chance of drawing one and two in succession is one in one hundred. Your chance of drawing out one, two, and three in succession is one in a thousand. You see how this is going? Your chance of drawing one, two, three, and four in succession is one in ten thousand, and so on, until you get to the chances of drawing one through ten in succession is one in ten billion. That's a good analogy for our life. You think of all the billions of contingencies that we live by every single day. From the time your eyes open in the morning till they close at night, think of all the things that could happen in your life, good or bad. And imagine jingling all those things up and putting them into a pocket and trying to draw them out as if you know what would happen it's astronomically bigger than one in 10 billion. And so when James says, if it's the Lord's will, that acknowledges the, the sovereignty of God and reminds us to be humble before the Lord. And he says, failing to be humble before the Lord and acknowledging his power over all things is evil and it's sinful. In fact, if you still have your bulletin there, flip over to 1 Chronicles 29. It's the call to worship that we read today. Listen to what it says. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. 
Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor comes from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. That's one of many, many places that the scripture points us to say God made it all, he owns it all, and he runs it all. To acknowledge anybody or anything else as having any power over God is to be evil and boastful against the Lord. If you went back and read some documents or even some placards and advertisements from uh, three or four centuries ago, uh, even in this country, you would find that the Puritans were fond of a Latin phrase, Deo Valente. It looks like this. It just means God willing. And often, whenever a poster would be put up advertising a coming event, it would say, this and that will happen on October, this and that, such and such at this time, and it would say, DV, down in the corner. Meaning, if God allows it to happen, our plan is for it to happen at this point in time. And they would include that, and I think um, that's a beautiful custom in some ways, but of course, uh, one person said, I realize the danger is inherent in its becoming cliche. And parenthetically, this author says, we all know we don't need more Christian cliches. So I'm not trying to say, here's a Latin phrase, start throwing that around because people need to hear it, because he's, this author says this, words are so much more easily counterfeited than the reality they represent. It's one thing to say something like Deo Valente. It's another to live like it's really true. And maybe everything we could do, we do in our life, we could put DV at the bottom. I have a calendar that I go by every day. Maybe on every day I should write what I need to get done for that day and I should put DV at the bottom. But that's only as good, um, it's only good if I really believe it and if I live it. It's one thing to have a slogan, it's another to live by it. And then I was maybe not surprised, but a little dismayed to find when I looked up Deo Valente, because I ran across it somewhere, in a more modern thesaurus, you know what the synonym that is given for Deo Valente is? Chance. And I thought, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Not only is that not a synonym of Deo Valente, it is an antonym. It's the exact opposite. Dio Valente, God willing, doesn't mean I hope something happens. It means God knows whether it would happen or not. Chance is not the same thing as God willing. James isn't saying, hey, don't get too excited about what's going to happen. It might not happen. He's saying that, but he's saying it from the right perspective is to say, if God is willing. Now, also know this, that cliche part of it. I used to work with a pastor who said God willing ad nauseum. I would say, we're going to meet at 4 o'clock this afternoon, right? God willing. Um, and I said, is it this Sunday or next Sunday when we're going to make that announcement? Next Sunday, God willing. And he said it over and over and over. And I, I don't doubt that he didn't believe that. But sometimes we say it too often. I'm not sure it always comes across the way it should be. But whatever it be, let it be the condition of our heart to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. And whether we say it out loud, let's at least know it in our hearts that whatever our plans are, for family, for finances, for business, even for our church, especially for our church, that it always be done God willing. So what do we do? We have to plan and we have to work knowing that God is the architect of all things. That yes, um, our plans are um, inconsistent, they're, they're sketchy at best, our lives are frail, but God is always on his throne. And if God is on his throne and I'm not, then God willing, this is how I should live. Humbly submitting to God and to his word. The attitude of humility acknowledges that God is God and I'm not. Secondly, make sure our plans are his plans, not just asking him to bless our plans. Boy, I'm guilty of that sometimes. I do what sounds right, what needs doing and all those kind of things. And then we pray a prayer. God, bless these plans and make them fruitful. Our first plan should be, God, give me your plans and then bless your plans. And hold me back if I'm not doing what you want me to do. So we humbly submit to God and his word. We make sure our plans are his plans. And finally, we accept the good providence of God according to his sovereignty. That even when our plans fall apart, very little of the first half of this service went like I wanted it to today. 
But God willing, he used it for whatever purposes he wanted to. In fact, I'm one of those people that have much more testimonies about what God did in spite of me, not through me. And I hope that's acknowledging the sovereignty of God. And I hope you can see the perspective of that. We give ourselves to God and let him do what he wants. The last thing I want to do is leave you with a picture. This is off the coast of Greenland, and in those frigid waters around Greenland, there's countless icebergs and ice flows. In fact, this is in the warmer time of year when there's only a few out there. Sometimes they're packed in there. But some of them are little and some of them are gigantic. You've seen that, that sometimes you can only see a small portion above the water when there's ten times more ice under the water. But if you've ever watched any of that, you'll notice that small ice flows sometimes move in one direction and those huge icebergs move in the opposite direction. What causes that? Well, the winds and storms that blow on the surface of the water blow the small ones in one direction, but the big ones always move according to the ocean currents. The wind on top is never stronger than the currents below. And one person says when we uh, see these little ones, those huge masses of ice are being carried along by deep ocean currents, then we should say this, when we face tragedies and trials, it's helpful to see our lives as being subject to those two kinds of forces, surface winds and ocean currents. The winds represent everything that's changeable, unpredictable, and distressing. But operating simultaneously with these gusts and gales is another force that's even more powerful. It's the sure movement of God's wise and sovereign purpose, the deep flow of his unchanging love. What a great picture. Often we live on the surface and we've blown to and fro, but know that the current of God's sovereignty and God's love flows beneath, always taking us where he wants us to go. Can we live in that? Can we say God willing because we trust where God is going, even when we don't know where we are going? That's our faith. And James says, let your faith turn to action. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you love us, that you have a sovereign plan for our lives. We thank you that you are doing that even now as we speak. I pray that in the midst of the storms and trials of life that we would find the perspective that we could trust you and know that not only do you have a plan, but that you love us and that you are acting according to our good. So give us eyes of faith to see that in that way uh, and let us live accordingly in our lives. And so we give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.